The archives at the British Antarctic Survey have some fantastic evidence of the creation of Rotherer Research Station, which is now the UK's largest science hub in Antarctica. Some of the photographs have been folded and scribbled on, which adds to the story. Let's start at the beginning, in 1957, with John Rotherer, who remembers arriving at the location that would later become Rotherer Research Station. There was so much loose rock that we could build a really decent cairn, and also it rose up quite a nice uh, height. And the big cairn we built on the top could be identified from other points around, from miles away. In many places, there wasn't much material. You had to revert to building snow cairns, which you knew were not going to last. But with a, a rock cairn, you knew it was there for good unless somebody came along and dismantled it. John and the team may have surveyed the area in 1957, but the real building work, the start of the station we'd recognise today, didn't kick off until just under 20 years later. Summer of 1976-77, the big construction work came in. This is Doug Holden. He was the base leader between 1973 and 1978. And that was the start of what Rotherer is now as a major airbase with modern methods and modern buildings and two storeys and using it very much as a summer camp, an intensive summer camp. That's where the concept had come, which the Antarctic Survey had developed at that time. Building a research station in Antarctica back then was a whole different ballgame from how it would be done today. Jerry Nicholson, who was an air mechanic between 1976 and 1979, remembers the cramped living conditions and how tough it was for the team while the station was slowly taking shape. I, mean, there were, I think, was it 43, 44 of us sleeping in the one hut at Rothera when we got round there while they were building the new first part of the new station. I think it's the chippy shop now. Um, we had one room for sleeping in where the bunks were three high. They were piled everywhere, there was no room, there was nothing and one room for eating and having meetings and stuff in to decide what we are going to do for the day. By the end of the summer, a lot of the work was still unfinished, so a reduced team, led by Dog Holden, stayed over the winter, carrying on the hard graft in freezing and isolated conditions. Not exactly a holiday, but they got it done. There was an awful lot left undone when the summer season ended and the big parties all went home, and there were 11 of us left, and the basic buildings had been put up, but there'd been no fitting in, inside. And so we had an extremely hard working winter in fitting out and painting and preparing uh, the huts. And these were huge huts designed to house 70 odd people in for the summer. And yet there were only 11 of us to do the work and we still had to live. So that was very intensive. But until mid winter, we hadn't been able to prepare the inside of the huts to sleep in. So we were living in tents at the time. The cooking was being done indoors, but not the sleeping. And I had pride at the end of that winter that a small band of men had achieved such a huge amount to get this thing ready for the next summer season when the planes came in. And we had this wonderful gleaming new base and generators all working. And when the planes came down, bingo, it was there. Even then, the challenges didn't stop. Rotherer still needed a new gravel runway, which, once built, was a game changer for the people living on the station. Geologist Mike Thompson remembers how it made travel safer and day-to-day -day work a whole lot easier. It gave you the ability to operate your aircraft at almost any time. It increased the safety no end because you had an airstrip which was almost up to, in a, in a, okay, in a lower way, but it's up to commercial standard. It's got lights, it's got beacons and all kinds of things like that. The other thing, of course, it did was it provided the opportunity for a, an intercontinental aircraft, the Dash 7, to fly in and out. So you can fly in from Punta Arenas, southern South America, or you can fly in from the Falkland Islands directly. And that means that in a, just a few hours, you can be in the Antarctic. With buildings and a runway now fit for purpose, David Drury, director of BASS between 1987 and 1994, realised that Rotherer could do more than originally planned. Rotherer had been developed primarily as a logistics hub and the amount of science going on at Rotherer was really quite small and 
we really felt that actually Rotherall would be quite a good place to develop some um, inshore marine biological work. At the same time, we were looking at reducing Signy Island um, in the uh, South Orkneys to a summer only operation. Faraday was going to be closed, which was an upper atmospheric research station. And we were going to concentrate therefore on utilizing Rothera and Halley as our main continental bases. So the move to build the Marine Sciences Laboratory you know, was part of the way we were going to reorganize the scientific fit of bass in the Antarctic. That decision had a big impact on the scientists working there. Zoologist and biologist Andy Clark recalls how the change opened up new opportunities for research and collaboration at Rothera. It, it was actually a very positive experience all round, I think. We'd moved from an old, an ancient base with old labs to a brand new lab, and it, it, was, it was terrific. We had space, we had a customised aquarium. We had an exciting new area to explore. Having access to aircraft was terrific. I saw a whole side to bass that I'd only known about in, direct, or in sort of committees and heard about. So suddenly I could experience what these guys did in the field. It, it meant also that I moved on to a multidisciplinary base. So I shared the bar with glaciologists and geologists in a way that you didn't at Sydney mm. because you were biology only at Sydney. And so it, it gave... I think if you took the opportunity, it gave you an outlook that you didn't otherwise have. And I, you know, I ended up socialising with engineers who look after aircraft. It broadened my experience in lots of ways, so I, I, I loved it. And if you're thinking we're missing a key piece of the Rotherer puzzle, you'd be right. Between its first building in 1994, there were dogs at the station. Their job was to help with sledging and field work. But in 1994, when non-native species were banned from Antarctica, they had to leave. Former dog handler John Sweeney shares how that decision affected those who worked closely with the dogs. By the early 80s, the skidoos had replaced the dog teams as the main method of transport for, for field parties. But they were kept on, I suppose, initially as an insurance against skidoos not working, but <clears throat> then they became a very important part of the recreation on base. And there was a lot of arguments right up until the dogs actually left of the very tangible welfare benefits that the dogs provided on base. Even if it had got to the stage where there was only three or four dogs around, or even one or two dogs on the base, that it's this, you know, facility for affection and confidence that anybody who has a, a pet would, would, would recognise. Traditionally, and for, since the 1970s, the dogs had always been on camp during the summer months but of course for the last summer the dogs weren't on weren't at Rothera so all those people who would usually be you know quite heavily involved in uh, in looking after the dogs and walking them exercising them running them had, had nothing to do with them it's been over 30 years since the last dogs left Rothera today the station is a thriving hub for biological research deep field science and air operations the newest chapter in the Rothera story is the Discovery Building, a bright, modern space that brings everyone together under one roof. From those first tents on bare rock to a world-class research station, Rothera has been on quite a journey, and we can't wait to see what the next 50 years will bring. <laughs>